why don't we get started? And I may need to administratively add some folks um, as they arrive in, but thank you so much for joining us today. Of course, Obi-Wan sitting right here to my right. I mean, we couldn't do it without Obi-Wan, right? So, and of course, former, but never ever um, historic Obi-Wan in the audience as well, Kathy, right? Hey, Kathy. Yeah, so let's give some recognition there, right? So tonight, we're here to talk about how we teach critical thinking. And this session is in succession. It's subsequent. We had a session last year, Gary and I did, mm -hmm. and it was thinking about critical thinking. And it was, we thought it was well-received. Um, what we were trying to do at that point was define this very nebulous subject. And, you know, it, we, we literally came up with what we think could very well be a publishable definition. Maybe we'll add to some of that tonight. We'll have to see. Um, but um, the point behind this evening's workshop is to build off of last year's workshop and, you know, our, our research that we've been conducting in this arena to talk about how all of us in, in our classes teach critical thinking. So are, do we have everybody in the waiting room? Uh, let's, okay, Kim's coming in. All right. So we'd like to, if we could, virtually go around the room and um, perform some introductions. But first and foremost, if I may, sure. I'm Stacy Boyer Davis. I'm an assistant professor of accounting. Please don't hold that against me. I realize that this is an OB management org, but hey, I'm all about accounting and crunching the numbers, but OB minded as well. Um, I also, I'm our assistant department head for accounting, CIS, cyber defense, finance. I do online teaching and learning scholarship and professional development. And I guess for the next year, I'm the MBA interim director. So we'll see. Um, but of course, to my right, no, it, go ahead, what? No, future university president being in, in the making, no doubt. <laughs> I would be remiss. Here we have in our, we have MOBTS royalty sitting here with me. Dr. Gary Stark, please, would you introduce yourself? Or maybe uh, there is no introduction needed. I'm Gary Stark. I am a professor of management, uh, org behavior, HR, all that stuff. Uh, what Stacey didn't tell you is she has a, a past in HR, so she will fit right in. She's a uh, woman of many talents. I don't know. This, <laughs> um, but you know what? We really, I see a, a number of familiar faces here. I think what I learned earlier today and last year, this is my second year, by the way, here, and this is how many years have you been now, Maritia? 16, <laughs> something like that. This is such an interconnected family I'm discovering here that whenever, whenever we have introductions, people are saying, oh, I've been to the last 20. I mean, look, Joe's in the room. So, I mean, how many years are we going to get with the... Uh, you didn't go to the first one, but you've been to every one since, if I remember, Joe. Uh, it's uh, 40, this is my 45th. So impressive. So what we'd like to do is, uh, I, I really miss being with you all, uh, and I know it'll take a little bit of time, but I'd just love for everybody to introduce themselves, say where uh, where they are, and uh, how many years you've been coming to uh, MOBTS. So we could do that, that would be wonderful. I think so. Should we start with Sarah? That's just Robert Sarah. She might win the award for being the furthest away, right? Yeah. <laughs> Although close to uh, right? <laughs> hi, everyone. I'm Sarah Wright. I'm a lecturer at the University of Canterbury in New Zealand, and I usually do win the award for being the furthest away. So it's nice to be at a virtual conference where I have no jet lag. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then how about William? Okay, I go by Bill. Those of you that know me, Bill Carter. I'm at University of Baltimore. This is my second MOBTS. It's my first VMOBTS, I'll tell you that, which I think is probably true with everybody. Um, and I teach strategic management and uh, am really working on putting this subject into that class uh, this next semester. So do a good session. <laughs> Diana, we just... We're going I'm by. Diana Smart. Uh, I'm with University of Michigan, Dearborn campus. I have been attending religiously MOBTS since wait, uh, Rhode Island. Was it 2017? Uh, um, right. I think it was. Um, yeah, so let's assume it's 2017. <laughs> and I've been to the international, both international and domestic uh, get togethers. Love it. Kathy Kane. Hi, uh, I'm Kathy Kane. I'm Professor Emeritus 
uh, University of San Francisco, but still teaching part-time. And um, this is my 30th OBTC, my second or second MOBT. Yes. And Kathy is my immediate predecessor as ob one Yeah. Trying to fill big shoes here. Ah, <laughs> uh, you're filling them great, Gary. High heels and all. <laughs> <laughs> Joseph? Oh, it's recorded. Sorry. Former president. Um, I am also emeritus from LaSalle University, where I taught for 40 years. So I started coming to the, the conference before, when I was still a doctoral student, and I'm still interested in coming. Thank you. Kathy Lovelace? Hi, I'm Kathy Lovelace. I'm at Menlo College, a professor of management. My first conference was in 1991, so I've known Joe uh, probably better than I know Kathy, but I've known Joe for that 30 years. I haven't always attended every year, but um, but I, it's, it's in my blood. And I just want to note, I mean, that first conference, I was really, I was only like 10 years old. So just, you know, <laughs> I you guys out there. <laughs> Jason. Hi, I'm Jason Myrowitz, Northern Arizona University, but I'm sheltering in San Francisco, and uh, this makes my sixth conference, um, but uh, still feels like the first time. Thank you. How about Carl? Uh, Carl Oliver. I'm a uh, senior lecturer at Loyola Marymount University. This is my, my second conference, and they're not consecutive. They're separated by some years. Thank you. Leanne? Hi, I'm Leanne Piggott, and this is my first MOBTS, but I did go to the international one in Christchurch earlier in the year. It was the uh, last time we were allowed out of the country. Um, my backdrop is to remind everyone that those of us um, in the Southern Hemisphere are in winter at the moment, so trees have no leaves. Um, and I'm the second most furthest away because uh, Sydney is where I hail from. I'm from the University of New South Wales in Sydney, and I'm in the Centre for Social Impact in the Business School. Thank you. Fernando? Hi, everybody. I'm Fernando Vargas from James Madison University in Virginia, <clears throat> and I wish I were either in Christchurch or Sydney today instead. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Julie? Hi everybody, uh, I'm Julie Seidel. I'm with Colorado Mesa University in Grand Junction, Colorado. Uh, I teach OB and this is my fourth uh, MOBTS. Excellent. Let's see, Bruce. Hi, I'm Bruce Payton from Menlo College. Uh, I teach a variety of things on creativity, sustainable business, design thinking, that sort of thing. And I'm a gray-haired rookie for this conference. <laughs> and you and Kathy Lovelace are right next to each other on uh, our screen, so that's pretty cool. Nice. Oh, how about Terry? Hi, I'm Terry. This is my first uh, conference here. Um, I teach a, a breadth of things, strategy and a leadership and organizational culture course, which is closest, I think, to this conference. I had a presentation yesterday. I teach innovation management, project management, new product development, a bunch of stuff like that. Thank you. Uh, Pooja? Hi, I am a second year doctoral student at Case Western Reserve University. MOBTS was the first conference that I ever attended last year, uh, and I found home there, and I'm attending the next one, and I hope to continue attending all of them. Yeah, and I teach this fall, so this is really helpful. Keep going. Uh, Janet. Sorry, everyone, struggling. It's only uh, just after 7 a.m. Um, I'm the second person from Sydney, Australia. Um, so depending on which way you fly, Sarah, we've got the, uh, we've got the jump on you in terms of being the furthest away. Um, I'm uh, um, deputy head of school of the School of Management. Um, and I um, teach a lot of sort of um, work integrated learning courses um, this at the moment. Thank you. 
Heather. Hi, uh, Heather Stewart, and um, it seems like there's a lot of Australians here. Um, <laughs> I'm from Griffith University in the Gold Coast, Queensland. So, um, yeah, it's winter here, but it's still sunny and beautiful, and I'm on the beach, so I can't complain. This is my second MOBTS, my first one being at um, with Sarah's um, one at University of Canterbury in February, which was fantastic. So, um, thanks. Okay, let's see. Uh, Deborah. I'm now unmuted. Um, I'm also from Australia. Obviously, I'm a colleague of, of Heather Stewart's, but I beat you all because I officially work at the University of Tasmania in Hobart. So I'm a, a very far south, but I'm currently on the beautiful Gold Coast. So um, I'm, um, I'm an accountant and, uh, <laughs> and I'm the head of discipline of accounting at the University of Tasmania. <laughs> And, uh, but I'm doing some work um, with Heather so uh, on uh, leadership in higher education. So we have a session tomorrow. So uh, we'd love to see you all there. Nice to meet you. And this is my first MOBT, although I did that paper with Heather that she presented at the beginning of the year. Welcome. Um, Oliver Benga. I'm glad to be here. I teach at Manhattanville College. I teach uh, fundamentals of management, uh, strategy. I teach uh, business ethics and a capstone class and um, senior seminar class. So this is my first time with BTS. I was part of the EEI LA Educator Institute, and it was a great time on uh, Saturday. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Yamuna. Uh, Yamuna? I'm sorry, I was unmuted. I was muted at that time. Uh, I'm Yamuna Baburaj. Uh, I'm, a, um, I'm attending um, MOBTS for the second year. Uh, and I teach strategy, uh, IB management foundations at, the, at Widener University. Very good. Welcome. And how about Yang? Yang, are you there? Okay. Well, I think we have just a wonderful group here assembled, yes, don't we? This is going to be, we'll have such wonderful interactions. Most of the, the workshop actually is just that. It's going to be a collective discussion amongst ourselves. We'll have breakout groups. We're going to talk about how we teach critical thinking and ways that we can strategize perhaps to improve um, the impact that we have in that realm. So Gary is going to start us off with a brief history of our work in this arena. Gary? Yeah, so uh, we both are, we're co-chairs actually of the NMU College of Businesses Assessment Committee. And uh, we do, well, she does a great job at it. I do an okay, okay job at it, but we've always been troubled by our measures of critical thinking and um, I mean, it's kind of funny that the AACSB let us get away with that definition, but it was basically, if I recall correctly, it was a finance problem. There's basically apply the formula. We got frustrated with that and we started searching for better ways of assessing critical thinking. But then we realized, well, we don't really even have a definition. Let's look up some definitions. Mm -hmm. 30 articles later, we figure we know a thing or two about it. Let's have a session about it. So uh, last year, we explored the topic of critical thinking. It's, it's a tough thing to get your uh, head around and, and nail down a definition. So that's the history. We did come up with some, um, yeah, it's actually people rarely define it. it the definitions are nebulous. Um, and there's some debate about the generalizability. There's an argument whether critical thinking is content specific Critical thinking for accounting may be different than for management, for example, versus a generalizable. So we've kind of tended towards the generalizable critical thinking. Uh, so we'll throw a couple of definitions at you. 
Well, actually, uh, Stacey's so going to talk about, we can run through these pretty quickly. We will. And it, we just have a brief bullet point list of, of what the literature says, critical thinking, and of course, our practice you know, states critical thinking is or isn't. And, and we're looking first at what it is not. A critical thinking is not the rote mimicking of others or just agreeing with others. Of course, we know it's beyond that in terms of evaluation, synthesis, and so forth. But um, there shouldn't be, of course, a bias in only one way of thinking or um, against or for. Um, drawing conclusions, of course, too quickly denying faults in one's own thinking or placing weight on insignificant details. And by the way, we'll provide this slide deck to all of you after this presentation so you have it because we have aligned literature with some imagery, which we find really important in our presentations. And of course, some of it has a bit of a, a comical twist. However, you know, it, it really does. Um, Stacy spent a lot of time on the comics, so she's very inform. proud and she wants to share that part with you. <laughs> But what it is, it's, so it's the antithesis of what we just talked about, what it isn't. We question the thinking of others. We embrace, perhaps, the thinking of others, or, or we argue the thinking of others, emulate it. We have a, an intellectual humility where we're willing to be wrong. That's a very important aspect of being able to critical think. Questioning thinking, putting logic before biases, although we teach uh, bias and attrition theory. And, of course, I did, I did pinch hit. And, and taught um, a graduate level OB class. Yes. So, you know, I, I do know a thing or two about this, but, and then we recognize contradictions. Okay, so we just wanted to kind of get our, you know, palettes uh, um, moving in the right direction so we can, you know, really have um, an engaging conversation here about what critical thinking is and how we do it. Now, Gary would like to reveal <laughs> to one of his favorite definitions in the literature of critical thinking, and I need to move the the slides out of the the people out of the way so he I, has I do like this one a lot and Burke Friel's done a lot of work in this area identify assumptions uh inform your, th your thoughts and actions check in the assumptions for accuracy and validity view ideas and actions from alternative perspectives and take informed action actually Stephen I think Stephen Burke Friel mm -hmm. was actually on our campus uh a few years ago and uh, I think we saved this slide or I saved the slide from there mm -hmm. and so I mentioned that last year we had a session where we, you know, put our heads together, you know, with what we've learned from, um, you know, the synthesis of our own research coupled with practice. And we had a few members of our audience that also had been conducting some research in this area. And we put together our own definition of what we believe it is. So this is from straight from MOBTS 2019 from Malane Cantori, which um, he's from. Um, he's from uh, Great Britain. Yeah, Great Britain, Miranda, Shave, and Fawzen, myself, and Gary. Cognitive and effective abilities and willingness to engage with ideas that are familiar or ours or unfamiliar others to explore and inquire into connections and disconnections, stepping into the unknown. It's an opportunity for creative uh, creativity that enables judgments and effective, helpful decision making across a variety of contexts. And we just talked about meta thought levels, deepness, and enacting um, as much as um, activity and process enables. So that was what we came up with. It's a bit wordy and kind of choppy. We're still working on it, but this was what we came up with last year. And Gary wanted to bring some history. From uh, and actually, at that, the tip of the hat to Rita Shea Van Fossen for bringing this one up. Uh, I think she's with us this summer, I, I but uh, so going way back to Sir Francis Bacon, 1604. I, uh, for myself, I find I found that I was fitted for nothing so well as for the study of truth, as having a mind nimble and versatile enough to catch the resemblance of resemblances of things, and at the same time steady enough to fix and distinguish the subtler differences, as being gifted by nature with the desire to seek, patience to doubt, fondness to meditate, slowness to assert, readiness to consider, carefulness to dispose and set in order and as being a man that neither affects, affects what is new nor admires what is old, and that hates every kind of imposture. That's much more poetic than our kind of messy definition. <laughs> We're no Sir Francis Bacon's. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that was just, you know, walking through our history, what we believe it is or isn't, what we've come up with from the literature as far as definitions are concerned in our own. Now, did we have a chat come through? Sorry, as you're presenting and you're also monitoring, sometimes that can uh, 
Uh, oh. They can quote just cause undergraduate head stuff. So <laughs> thank you, Bill. <laughs> that's great, Bill. It's very true. So how do we teach critical thinking? And that's where we're about to um, head into with our workshop activity. We would like for all of us to spend at least 15 minutes talking about, given these definitions that we presented, how we teach it, strategies perhaps that um, you know, we could, you know, perhaps maybe even, um, you know, improve what we do from that way from a professional development standpoint, but we at least want to get a baseline of what we are all doing in our classes and just have a really engaging conversation about that. So I'd like to use, and you may want to, do you want to add anything to that of what we're going to do, the deliverables uh, of the workshop? Right. Uh, yeah, so we'll put you in breakout sessions for, yeah. I think, uh, 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Uh -huh. And then we're going to have a think pair share and the groups will come back and report what it is that collectively they do in their classes to teach critical thinking. Then we're going to have robust conversation. Um, we um, want to debate perhaps some of these things or, you know, just, um, you know, agree collectively. But anyway, we have lots of conversation to have. It'll randomly assign you to some groups, as you know. So are we ready to get started and talk about how we teach critical thinking? All right, I will stop sharing for a moment. Bear with me here as I now break out rooms and we have how many now? Oh, we're up to 24. This is great, including the two of us, so I know. So I think maybe that would be sufficient for, let's say five rooms. What do you think? Uh, sure. Five rooms. All right, are we ready? Off we go, teleporting into our breakout rooms. I'm gonna get um, Yes, so I, we made a point of, I think there was two other critical thinking type sessions uh, at MLBTS this year. So we made a point of going to those. And um, and one that I found, there was two particularly interesting ones, but I really like this. It's a fairly simple idea. Um, and we all do various cases, maybe small cases, large cases, problems in class. Um, so thank you, Diana, for sharing. Uh, but um, in this case, what you do is you have groups create a narrative from at least two different points of view. And I don't know if anybody was in that session. I don't of, of us. I, I, I don't know. But uh, so I thought that was pretty neat what they did. So uh, in this case, it was an individual who uh, uh, worked for a very conservative bank and showed up the first day wearing an earring and was immediately fired. And so what you had to do, what the group had to do is create a narrative. So basically you had to speak for the uh, employee and then somebody else had to speak for the employer. And then if you want to make up more roles, if you want to speak for the judge, if you want to speak for the public or something like that. But, uh, but in the course of the group doing that, of course, you're taking different viewpoints. And that's part of the critical thing. I think that fits in with uh, Sir Francis Bacon's definition. So uh, that's one I found interesting. Um, another idea that came up was, um, and now I'm starting to wonder, I'm trying to remember who was in that session. I maybe, maybe this is gonna be shared from another group if other people are in that session, uh, but using debates, but in those debates, force them to anticipate the other side's arguments. So it's, um, uh, some of the same sort of idea. Uh, different session came up with, uh, this was from drawing out critical conversations. Um, and basically it was just that you were drawing, uh, give them a topic and make them draw it. A lot of times, especially in management and business, um, I'm trying to think of a polite way to say this, but I'm not sure our students think that deeply, they're pretty instrumental in their thinking but you give them a topic and have them draw it. And in fact, this one was just that the, the prompt was last semester. And this was my drawing. <laughs> These are all the motions I went through. <laughs> uh, but just getting, just drawing, you, without realizing you draw on some inner, uh, some inner things that you might, and then by drawing them, you, it brings those things to the surface. So I thought that was pretty neat. Um, I have some other ideas here too, but I'd like to hear some more of yours. Although I think, do, I think we, we still have time. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, you know, can I share one thing? Um, I find that, of course, we, we still have a good 10 minutes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I find that students are not comfortable with the process of critical thinking. That, you know, it, um, it, of course, on Bloom's taxonomy, it's far easier to, you know, be meeting that knowledge, you know, level versus analytics. And as you, you know, move forward, further up, you know, that triangle that, you know, it's, just, it, it's more challenging for them. And, and they don't feel comfortable in that arena, but we know that they should be uncomfortable. Uh, uncomfortable from the perspective of pr pushing themselves to think, you know, more deeply, reflect more on things. So, you know, I kind of, when the class begins, I lay that ground rule that, look, you know, it, it shouldn't be easy. We need to be, um, you know, um, it, it's, it's so much more than, than just definitions and understanding the concepts. It's, it's, as we discussed what it is and what it isn't, you know, I try to have, you know, an initial conversation so that they know, because I find some students, I mean, look, here we are, we're academics trying to define what it is, right? So um, our students just don't know. And if we don't take the time to explicitly review in class with them what it is, then how can they know what our expectations are? So there is a rubric that I'll share with you later that I think is really helpful in, you know, kind of helping the students disseminate for themselves what it is and what it isn't. But if I don't have that conversation in class, they just don't know what the expectations are. So I find that to be helpful. That's kind of the bridge that you got to get them to, you know, traverse. Otherwise, you know, even if you do demonstrate critical thinking and you are a fish in water, I don't know. It just, um, it, you, you still need to explicitly just, you know, yeah, <laughs> explicitly, sorry, administrative work there, explicitly need to have that conversation. Okay. Yeah, we just added somebody to the group, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, Greg or maybe be. not. Okay. Maybe. Greg has uh, been my friend since um, graduate school. Really? Since like that. Yeah. He and his, he, well, talk more, but he and his wife are my wife and uh, mine's some of our oldest couple friends. So Greg, <laughs> get your butt in here. <laughs> I might need, I I'll send him a note. What do you think? Yeah. Thing that I do in my ethics class, um, there's again, I, I snagged that from JMP. Um, George Williams in Thailand uh, case. So it's about George uh, Williams, who is a supervisor in a company that does some sort of shipping from a dock somewhere. And it's like, you know, so students read the case, and then I ask them to think through uh, five or six ethical approaches to lenses. And if you were a proponent of utilitarianism, what would you advise George to do and why? Uh, if you're a proponent of um, legalism, what would you advise George to do? So, and we have a class discussion. We talk about what legalism is and what are the, you know, the assumptions and what would George then be advised to do. Then we discuss utilitarianism and what is that and, and, and what would George be if he were a proponent or you were a proponent what would you then do? And so students see different angles, different perspectives yep. that they believe. And then we ask everybody, what well, what would you person which one do you subscribe to of these notions? And uh, what would you do? And did you change your mind in the process of mm -hmm. hearing different uh, approaches? So that's not a good one that I and again I, I can share that with the group. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thank you. Again, that idea of take, uh, forcing you to take a different perspective, I like that. Mm -hmm. um, and they argue, can you teach me ethics? No, I can't. <laughs> you're like ethical, you know, but I can give you information and at least the tool to realize that people are different and what you judge as highly unethical may not be viewed as such, but the other person, just because they subscribe to a different perspective, view, and, mm -hmm. uh, or, or just an idea all the other. Hey, let's, uh, let's put Greg on the spot. <laughs> Hi, Greg. Need on me? Did is your office always that messy, or did John get in there and mess everything up? <laughs> is your office always that messy, or did John get up? Or did John oh, get yeah, in there and mess I everything up? I was just telling them that you and Charlene are Anna mine's oldest couple friends, probably. Oh, yeah. So. And you, you've known uh, Charlene <laughs> for 
since high school, even though we went to Not different high here. schools. Yep. Yep. Technically. Technically. Sure. Anyway, so how do you teach the critical thinking? So I wanted to think about it um, <laughs> more than think about how I teach it. My biggest challenge, I think, in my class, I think Diana and Gary know that I'm an operations management person, so I don't know that I am in the habit of teaching critical thinking so much as um, trying to get students to think about tool use and using the right tools to solve, solve the right problems as operations management problems are introduced in the class. So I don't want to sound like I'm passing the buck, but yeah. it's, you know, most of the time students have developed some good or bad habits prior to my class when they have me as juniors or seniors. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But with that in mind, I'm looking for new ideas uh, to, um, it, it's, it's not difficult to identify students that have challenges in the first month of class that could use a little extra help, but I often don't know exactly where to send them. Um, they're like dramatically, they're reading word problems, dramatically selecting the wrong tool or just picking up. And if I give them an equation of, uh, I'm sorry, a, a sheet of equations to pick from, I don't make them memorize equations. They've got a calculator and a list of equations on exams, but they just have a challenge. So again, Mm -hmm. well, yeah, Which one they exactly. use? And it's either that they're not studying, they're not working uh, homework problems, they're not engaged in the class, they don't find other students to study with, mm -hmm. or fundamentally they've done poorly in an accounting class or a finance class before they were or never have used uh, that much math. Uh, there are management students who uh, took managerial finance and stats and then haven't had a math class, mm -hmm. <laughs> applied math class in a year and a half or two. Um, they just haven't. Um, so I was just, yeah, I was looking for, I'm looking for ideas for how to introduce critical thinking. I don't have that as a learning outcome necessarily of my course, um, but, but I rely on others who presumably might have already so supported one thing, uh, and, and by the way, Greg, uh, tell me where you're from. We did this earlier. Where are you from, and or what school you're at, and how many MOBTSs have you been to? I'm wearing my T-shirt from my first yeah. one. Also, I, Diana's first one, Providence College. What? Providence that was also Providence. Diana's first one. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. that's right. yeah. Um, so Gary talked me into attending. <laughs> because I was stepping down from being a department chair and I needed uh, some right brain uh, activities. <laughs> and, uh, and let's see, so I'm originally from the Kansas City area. I met Gary at Kansas State University. Uh, never have worked with him really. Nope. <laughs> um, I spent some time, I, I worked for two years full time at St. Pete College down in Clearwater and then I've been here at Fort Hayes State University in East Kansas and what year was John born? <laughs> 506. Uh, 2006. So <laughs> this will be my 15th year of coming at Fort Hayes State. Uh -huh. Is this going to kick us out of done? Uh, no, least? I'm going to. Uh, if, yeah, I'll, okay. I'll go ahead. And, but you know what, Greg, may I say something? You brought up such a great point when it comes to critical thinking. You have to have that baseline knowledge to be able to connect the dots from one area to other or be able to interpret or analyze or dispute or argue or whatever. And if you don't have the prerequisite knowledge, you know, coming into your ops management class, the accounting, that math, that, you know, finances, other fundamentals, then how are you able to critically think? So it isn't sometimes teaching the techniques on critical thinking, although that's important too, but it's also having that baseline knowledge from which to be able to critically think. So we kind of have those two paralleling areas that, you know, if well, we- it's, it's funny that you mentioned that. That's the exercise that we just went through at three o'clock with two of my colleagues who presented on something we were calling a mountaineer's exercise where yeah. there's, um, Oh, is that going to close on me? 
retire. Well, in 52 uh, seconds. <laughs> all they're going to say is, well, uh, you know, it's, it's not a problem that I got a C in stats or a C in managerial finance. I should be able to earn an A in your class if I just work hard. And, um, uh, right. and so, so you don't have background. Our exercise is more of a reflection yeah. exercise at the beginning of the semester to see about that a little bit. Uh, but we do, we do try to have them at least think about their gaps, even if we don't have time to address the gaps directly. Mm. In class. Cool. Anyway. Okay. So do you have a, a required foundational class where that's a, a program learning outcome where you know it's going to be addressed and assessed? We're critically thinking for our assessment. It's embedded in all of it's, our yeah, courses. Yeah, we try to embed it in all our courses. So. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> All right. We, oh, oh. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> we have both our computers on. We are back. All 24 of us, and we had uh, five breakout rooms. So why don't we start with, uh, I'm going to go to breakout room five and begin there. Breakout room five was Deborah, Heather, Kathy, Kathy Lovelace, and Terry Schumacher. How do you teach critical thinking and what other aspects would you like to share with the group? I'll say that one of our topics was uh, we go to comedy. We have a Stephen Colbert uh, clip or something where he, he takes the news and then he really flips it over and takes a completely different slant on it to make it funny. And so if you do improv, if you had your students doing a little improv in theater, that forced them into it. But watching others do it, and the students watch these things anyhow. Mm -hmm. And uh, I actually uh, record some, some things online, but I edit them down. I don't have them watch a whole show, which might be 30 minutes. I have them watch a two or three minute clip or something, which is uh, uh, focused on one thing. And then you can ask about that. We also do it with some simulations too. We have, uh, I have some computer simulations where you, you, you play with one role like the manager, then you play with another role like the employee, and that causes you to adopt an alternative interpretation of events. Outstanding. What else do we have from group five? Deborah, Heather, Kathy. Anyone else? I, Kathy was really good in explaining, and she might be better in explaining it herself, but I sort of came in first and just after your presentation, my head was going to, well, and I'm, I'm not saying this is how I'm actually thinking, but the thought that came through my head was like, can we teach critical thinking? Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. There's, yeah. There's some we, we did talk about like all the different definitions and how at least at, at my school, our definition of critical thinking is, is really kind of synonymous to maybe problem solving. And so there's, there's always a, a lot of similarities. And I, uh, with a couple colleagues of mine, we published an AMLE article looking at how we can do web-based uh, simulations, how they, how getting students into an active learning environment, you know, via the, the simulations uh, for us was an effective way to teach critical thinking and we were able to do pre-test post-test and to show that that there was some success there uh, but i've been trying to do some other ways of teaching critical thinking through other experiential learning uh techniques but um but we just we we really kind of talked about how you have to get the students attention certainly and so having provocative assignments where they are engaged is, I think, a requirement. Maybe you could share the, uh, the reference to that in the, okay. um, the chat. Okay, I will, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Should we go to four? Uh, anybody else from group five or should we go to group four? Okay, group four was Carl, Kathy Kane, Felicia, Sarah Wright, and Yamuna. So uh, Felicia, I wonder, so Felicia, uh, why don't you say what we talked about? So I, I know myself um, and Sarah, we both were in group four with Kathy and a few others, but Sarah and I were the 
I would say the two who felt like we weren't really teaching critical thinking in our courses. And we're, we both said we were kind of here to try to figure out the strategy to do so. But in talking, we kind of realized that we might, because we're critical thinkers, we inherently be imparting that information on our students, but trying to really provide a structure for that uh, can be a little bit challenging, but bringing in different resources to help guide students along through the process. So that's what we really talked about. And Kathy provided some insight into the use of dialogue to help with critical thinking. And she referenced the study at MIT, and I believe David Boom, who's doing who's done research on dialogue. So I'm definitely looking into those resources to help. Um, because I teach uh, graduate classes now, so I'm really looking to add the critical thinking into my courses as the students move through the program. And one of the things we talked about last year, uh, the idea of critical thinking is teaching is, is really a separate topic, or do you integrate critical thinking into, I wouldn't say everything you do, but here's an exercise one here's an exercise in chapter three that has an objective but within that you know besides teaching uh something about organizational citizenship behavior besides that there's some critical thinking involved so uh, there's ways you can and you can do it either way teach it as a separate topic or integrate it into other things. Would you well do? i was i was saying that i I asked the students actually before I introduced dialogue to them, what is critical thinking? What do you think critical thinking is? And I, and I say, and I say, and don't say it's about critiquing things because it isn't. And so then they start answering that question. And interestingly enough, they pretty much get to the bones of it uh, among themselves. They, they can answer that question. Not everybody has a full answer, but they, they have some notion of what critical thinking is. Then I introduce them to the guidelines for dialogue, and then we just jump into dialogue. And then afterwards, as we're debriefing dialogue, we're looking at how that helped us be better critical thinkers. Um, going to the definitions that you were working with, um, pretty much similar to the guidelines for dialogue. Thank you. Anyone else? Breakout room four. Shall we move to three? Let's move to breakout room three. Fernando, Janice, Julie, Pooja, and Bill. Hold on, I'm typing something. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, I'll, I'll just kind of chime in and, and the other folks in my group can add on just some keynotes that I had. Um, we talked about information literacy, which is really important, um, especially this day and age. And, and I, I coined a little phrase that I really liked and wrote down and I'm going to use it in my class. We need skeptics, not sheep. <laughs> so skepticism, I mean, is, is an inherent part, I think, of critical thinking that you don't just take things on face value or what other people say or what other people are doing. Um, I think some themes that we covered too is that, and, and part of it relates to some of the things that I'm using in my class is people, people rarely stop and think about thinking. And this might've been what you guys talked about last year. Mm -hmm. And so I think it helps to, to, to give the students a perspective on how, how do you think? How do human beings think? What are different ways? You know, Daniel Kahneman talks about system one, system two thinking. So get them to think about thinking. Um, the critical thinking is a perspective. You know, it's just developing a habit of good judgment and skepticism and how you approach the world. There are certain methods you can use, specific techniques of analysis and critical thinking. And there are at times different processes. You need. So it's all of those things. It's not just becoming smart. It's not following some rote pattern. It's not just being creative. It's doing all of these things and, and have all of those in a, in a toolkit. Outstanding. Anybody else want to report from group three? Moving on to group two, breakout room two. 
that would be Bruce, Emilio, Jason, and Leanne. Uh, we had uh, different approaches to uh, teaching critical thinking in our group, um, a more structured approach and a less structured approach. Um, thinking about the more structured approach, a couple of the key themes that came out of that is uh, within the debate of how to teach critical thinking, uh, or even the question, can you teach critical thinking? Uh, I think the view of the group was that uh, it's more effective to teach, it can be taught and it's more effective to teach it within context. So teaching it within uh, the, the actual subject matter is probably the most effective way to teach it. And then thinking about different methods, I'll just talk about the one that I used and then other members of the group could um, share theirs. Um, I was responsible for teaching a large first year undergraduate course. Uh, the first course the students took straight out of high school and it was really important to shift them as quickly as possible off the memorization method. Uh, so we developed, uh, my, t my colleagues and I developed um, a method which we called ACAR, which is argument, counter-argument, rebuttal. And underpinning it was uh, the idea of taking a very contemporary case, something out of the newspaper, for example, but requiring the students to have to research in presenting their arguments. So the first thing they had to do in response to a problem that was very current um, was to make an, an argument that was evidence-based. Then uh, phase two was they then had to counter their own argument, again, drawing, going back into the literature and, and evidence-based counter-argument. Then they had to rebut their counter-argument and in doing so strengthen their original argument and therefore also developing the skill of, of, a, of an argument that is, is connected. So it was forcing them to themselves in teams argue, counter and rebut, and it had to be research um, informed, but something contemporary so that they could relate to it. Thank you, Leanne, very much. I love Leanne's approach, and uh, I wish that I had something that was as structured as that to introduce the concept of critical thinking to my students. Uh, what I tend to do is have questions that sort of are more integrated into the other topics of the semester. So for instance, in my current topics and management class, um, we have a unit on globalization. And then this past term, I added a unit on coronavirus, um, but they were completely distinct ideas. Uh, but then I asked them to uh, write a paper that answers the question, will uh, the effects of COVID-19 lead to an increase or decrease in globalization? And so it forces them to kind of find the connections between uh, disparate parts of the course. Um, and the other thing that I mentioned in, in our session that, uh, that I like is in my, uh, when I teach this capstone strategy class, uh, I start off by kind of giving them a review of some of the things that they uh, covered in their other courses that they may have forgotten. And so you ask them a couple of OB questions, a couple, uh, but I ask them a couple of uh, math questions because they tend to have forgotten things that they learned in their stats classes and their econ classes. Um, and then the one that I think really resonates is if you have a symphony playing and it takes uh, a group of five musicians playing five different instruments, 60 minutes to play Beethoven's fifth, how long will it take 10 musicians to play the same symphony? And so they all start doing the algebra and trying to figure it out. But then you say, no, think about what you're actually doing. Uh, you have here a, a symphony. It's going to be just as long no matter who's playing it. And so it forces them, I think, to uh, try to use a little bit of, of critical uh, or at least analytical thinking uh, before jumping in to try to apply the tools that they have. Thank you. Did we uh, present our yeah. group one? I think, uh, Joe? Joe, I think you were taking notes for us and break yep. out. Yep. Um, we have a couple of, we talked a lot about exercises and actually um, uh, Diana was nice enough to find a couple of them and posted them in the chat um, as PDFs. So you can, you can take those. I'll very quickly talk about those. And then I have kind of a summary statement I'll make. Uh, one exercise was what's happening in your neighborhood 
and basically people have to share information and 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 listen to what others say to find out what the common themes were um another person talked about um thinking about a strategy course and having to break that down into um that a way to handle issues in there was to make it up kind of a problem solving method um there was a case about a uh, a male employee who comes to work the first day and he's wearing an earring and was immediately fired um and then asked the person to take the perspective of the employee, the manager, HR, a bunch of others. Um, I found that idea of multiple perspectives to run through a number of the things that we talked about. Um, uh, Diane also talked about uh, a case called George Williams, where there's a question about whether you should pay a bribe and forces the students into several different perspectives um, analyze this case from this perspective, analyze it from this perspective before actually asking them to make a choice. Um, so you're thinking about the case through four or five different lenses. Um, that idea of taking multiple perspectives on a case um, or defining it and then redefining it. Someone mentioned the idea of a debate where you started out with your side of the debate, but then you had to take and try to take some time and try to figure out what the other side was going to say in the debate. Um, think about gaps in perspective. Seemed to be a really interesting idea for critical thinking. That and so we present to you a couple of exercises um, uh, uh, to use that that are there in the chat. Thank you very much, Joe. Harry? Um, oh, yeah. Uh, oh, what was I going to mention? Um, oh, uh, this is one of those things where you just sort of introduce it uh, sort of naturally into any topic. Um, and I find I end up doing this. And this is to create a sense of uh, disequilibrium. Um, so some of you know and are fans of, and I am, uh, the, the Make It Stick book. And one of the things uh, they suggest in, in that book is generation. And generation is the idea of solving a problem really before you know, uh, before you've been taught about it. And that's that, uh, that's sort of the, that introduces the idea of mental disequilibrium. Focus their attention. Uh, they'll have perspective that when they look, they may have a different perspective, but when they gain everybody else's perspective, they remember that they were wrong. If there's a right, wrong answer. And that is helpful to remember. I think part of um, critical thinking is there's a big humility there. And I think sometimes that's something we're always lacking. Oh, sorry. It's, somebody just told me I'm hard to hear. Um, so yeah, this concept of humility, when uh, in a subtle way, introduce them to other ideas, subtly maybe get them to change their mind. Uh, and that's the concept of uh, mental disequilibrium. And then they start to see, they're naturally critically think as their group uh, solves the problem. Um, one other thing that I, <laughs> I like to do is, uh, and I call it Socratic questioning. I'm not sure if technically it's Socratic questioning, but I'm in the habit of, in, at least in my classes, rarely answering a question directly. A student will ask me a question uh, and I'll say, well, what do you think? And they'll give me an answer and I'll say, well, let me take this segment of the answer. Let me push you on that. What makes you think that? So, um, which I think is pretty, pretty close to the concept of Socratic question, but if you can avoid those uh, direct answers, then they have to do a lot of the work themselves. So just a, just a couple more things. So our session is scheduled to go to six o'clock. I know that Brandon, I don't know if he's um, spying on us or listening in, but he tends to, he won't shut us down for another couple minutes, but 
I uh, wondered if there was any questions. Um, I know you well, probably for a lot of you it's dinner time or breakfast. <laughs> in this season. Uh, so you don't need to stick around. But uh, meanwhile, if you have any questions. Uh, Dog walking else time for Heather. Dog walking time. <laughs> getting close to dinner time. I, I think Terry, I saw his hand go up. I have a comment. As people talked, I thought of one more thing. In my leadership class, we look at Conger, his book on charismatic leadership. Yeah. And in that model, you look at here's the current situation, what are the problems it has, and the leader has to have a vision that solves those problems. So this, it's again this two views. Here's how it is, here's how it will be if you join me in my pursuit of the vision. And that it's a creative act to come up with that vision, but it's again this looking at from two different perspectives. One is critical of the current situation. The vision criticizes the way it is today is not acceptable. And if we achieve the vision, whatever the problem we face, that will be resolved or some problems will be resolved. So that's another, uh, something I teach, which I think helps support critical thinking. Is that in a particular book or article of his? It's or called Charismatic <laughs> Leadership. I think it's 97 or 98. It's a book, eight chapters. <laughs> Chapter two has the uh, the model of charismatic leadership of yeah. assessing where you are and where will you be, where do you want to be to solve those problems, you know. If you can do it easily enough, can you share that in the chat? The... Sure, I have to find my syllabus, but I've got it. Oh, okay, I mean, I yeah, don't. No, I've got it. Okay. Isn't it amazing how, with all of the different contributions this evening, there might be, you know, some underlying themes, but we all really are practicing it in, a, you know, various, you know, various aspects in our disciplines and our courses. And uh, oh, there we go, gap analysis. For, yep. Okay. Thank That's you, Greg. Right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But you know, I find that if we don't explicitly, you know, describe or at least provide, you know, um, I like to provide a rubric that identifies what critical thinking is or isn't. So that can kind of start the conversation. And um, I like to really have in class time to, you know, not just assume that students may, you know, understand. I mean, yes, do we all implicitly perhaps, but you know, lay the ground rules, try to develop that understanding with role play, debate, simulations, whatever. Um, but making sure to have that explicit conversation about what critical thinking is or isn't. Any other questions from anyone else? Or comments or yeah, further comments. insights? <laughs> Please. I think one thing I tie into, so I link critical thinking to then problem solving process, and this is for strategic management, but I think it works for everything. It goes back, um, one of the women in my group was talking about how she studied film and then you broke down watching a film and all the different parts. And so systems thinking, if you're trying to teach critical thinking about complex problem solving, I think giving them some grounding in systems thinking, being able to see things as a bunch of different pieces that are then related and breaking them all apart to understand it is, is a good approach. A little chaos, Bill? Complex adaptive systems, chaos theory, whatever you want to call it. That's right. Any other comments, thoughts, suggestions? Just building on what Bill's what Bill just said, it would be great if we could find uh, accessible approaches to systems thinking, because uh, there's there's lots of technical stuff out there, but none of it stuff that my students can read and use. Uh, that might be an area where we could all contribute. But there's a, why don't you contribute, or why don't you uh, propose that session for 2021 at Cal Bruce, Bruce <laughs> what, what subject do you teach? What would you use that for? I am teaching sustainable business and some, I'm teaching a course on uh, social impact in a global economy. Uh, and what I'm finding is that it's really hard to get people to students to understand how one idea might be connected to another one that's not immediately adjacent. 
I mean, within, within a firm, one of the things I'm going to use is Porter's work on um, activity systems. Mm -hmm. You think about all the different activities that go on in a business and how they're in the interdependencies. That's how I'm going to be using it. So it, you know, if you can put it within the context of one um, firm, or if you're looking at an industry, there's all this literature out there now about ecosystems, which gives you a framework for maybe describing those kinds of things. I agree with you. You can't teach systems theory because that, that'll blow MBA students' minds, right? But if you can give them examples to just show how to look at something as a system and start becoming aware of those interdependencies and uh, path dependencies and some of those concepts, that, that's, a, that's a big start, I think. Thank Bruce, you. I'm happy to help with that. We, I'm from the Center for Social Impact in the Business School and we teach oh. social impact and the entire pedagogy that we work with is, is about systems change underpinned by systems thinking and especially for our big undergraduate flagship course which is called creating social change we teach um, system thinking in a way that basically builds a, a toolkit so we've developed um, some little films and some readings and exercises so would love to run a session with you on that next year okay wonderful thanks okay. I know what session I'm going to next summer. <laughs> I was going to contribute that I've done for, for business ethics, I've done a systems approach to resolving ethics problems. Uh, there's a published article, you can Google it. Uh, the Wolf Situation, I think, is the title of it. Thanks, Carl. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, Carl. Well, and thank you to everyone who joined us this evening for this session. We very much appreciate this discussion on this nebulous topic <laughs> and how we can try to wrap our arms around it and teach it um, in a way that is probably even more nebulous sometimes for our students. So we very much appreciate your time this evening. And our email addresses um, are provided in the slides. Feel free. You know how to get a hold of Gary. But my, my email there is it's there as well. And I'm more than happy to answer any questions, share the slide deck. Just to have a conversation with you about this topic because we find it to be so very interesting and probably we'll have another session next year i'm not sure what it would be last year was thinking this year's teaching <laughs> maybe so. next year assessing i i don't know could be mm -hmm. and we just get so many great ideas that this is two years in a row so <laughs> i'd like to keep this going and if thank any you. of you are interested in joining us please let us know thank you thanks so much everyone